Hey everybody, welcome. Today we are talking about Donald Trump on the Joe Rogan experience. There was weaving, whale psychology, Whoopi Goldberg, some 2020 election denial paperwork that we're gonna get someday, and an angle on Trump as your funny uncle who has those crazy stories about the time he compared nuclear arsenals with an unhinged dictator. All right, welcome everybody. Take it away, Drew. What was it like for you? It was a ride. Um, the funny uncle thing landed with me because the, I was I found myself laughing more than I found myself educated about his actual policy. And I felt like he tricked me. I don't know if you felt that way. I didn't feel like he tricked me, but this was definitely Rogan as a conversationalist. And look, yeah. I, I make no qualms about the fact Rogan is the goat. And on this, I went into it thinking that we might get that Rogan who pushes and who really pins people down, won't let them walk away. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You said this, let's get into it. And I think because it's, such a heavy political thing. He went hard in the opposite direction. Yeah. And so, I mean, fair enough. He needs to do the interview that he wants to do. Um, but I would have loved to have seen the more hardcore Rogan come out at some point. I think that would have been awesome. Absolutely. And I, I immediately go back to the Terrence Howard uh, episode where Terrence had PowerPoint p presentations, PDFs, live models. Then he brought Eric Weinstein on and they were going at it too. And it's like, in that interview, I've seen more policy and debate. And, and in this interview, he was just, yeah, I paid off the debt. Yeah, if George Washington and Abraham Lincoln teamed up, they couldn't beat me. Like it was, and uh, I was like, what? In his defense, he said somebody else said that to him, but I did love that he was using that as a bit of credibility. So yeah, it, uh, oh man, it's tough. As an interviewer, mm -hmm. you really have to decide what am I trying to do with this interview? And if yeah. you're running a debate, you're gonna get a lot of no's. There's no way he's gonna get Trump on to come on if this is gonna be basically him and other experts, let's say on the economy, debating whether Trump did or didn't do something. Yeah. He probably would have done it if it was him and um, Kamala, maybe, I guess, because he turned down the other debate. So yeah. I won't say that for sure he would do that, but that might've had some juice. But mm -hmm. um, Rogan said, look, I wanna to talk to these guys like they're normal people. He still wants to get Kamala on. And I would love to see that for a balanced perspective, just see her come on and, and because the one thing that I really did like about this is the more I dig into Trump and the crazy things that he said when he didn't even realize that he was being recorded, he sounds exactly like he sounds when he knows he's being recorded. Yeah. So to me, I think Trump is really very transparent. There's kayfabe, which we talked about last time for sure. There's posturing for sure. But I think the right way to read Trump is this is a guy that has a hardcore frame of reference. He sees the world through his lens. I think he believes the things that he says, but he is so good at framing things in a way that makes him sound good mm -hmm. that if you're on his team, he just gives you everything you need to repeat to make him sound awesome. And if you think he's out of his mind, then he just sounds like uh, somebody who's full of... Um, hyperbole, uh, he's just totally, oh, how would you, braggadocio? I'm not sure yeah. what the right way to say that phrase is, but like, he's just bragging all the time. He's big upping himself, as the Brits would say. Yeah. And so that's what you see a lot in this, in this interview. The first claim that we have to talk about is a 2020 stolen election. And while I appreciate how he answered the question in the sense that he wasn't saying the voting machines were broken, but he added in the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story, how some of the legislative laws around voting were changed very conveniently, and some of this lawfare that we're even seeing now in this in this election cycle. Mm. So it wasn't necessarily they cheated, look at what they did, but how it was a coordinated attack through multiple touch points. I, and that was the time where Rogan kind of pushed him, like, what do you mean? Will you show me these documents? Like, get to yeah, the but this is This is where he started weaving. So mm -hmm. um, what really bothered me about that is I think the election really does, for people that are divided, they're divided largely over, is Trump actually going to become a dictator or not? Period. Is this yeah. posturing or is he actually going to become this unhinged guy who just, you let me have a dry run on January 6th. I learned my lesson. I know what I need to do better now and I'm going to get it right this time and I am going to break democracy forever. We're never going to have another election again. That's really what's going on. And if Trump is going to ask people to believe that the election was stolen, he has got to come with receipts. Mm -hmm. And the fact that in this interview, he said, look, how about we do this another time and I'll bring like all these documents, so many documents, you won't believe it. And look, I'm somebody that is right now most likely voting for Trump. I'm, unless something changes, I'm voting for Trump. And 
even I was like, bro, like that's crazy. That makes you sound absolutely terrible. And you have to understand that if if you have the receipts, lay them out systematically, go through them one by one, don't make big promises. Mm -hmm. Like you're getting on the biggest podcast in the world. This is your shot. And the fact that he said, uh, we'll do it another time. It's like, dude, we're nine days out from the election. This is never gonna happen. Never so never. it's clearly an election ploy. And so I would much rather see him just let go of that. Like it, it is what it is. The 2020 election played out the way that it played out. We're back now. This is about moving forward. This is about doing what you know I believe is right for the country. If he had even that little modicum of uh, presidential language of wanting to unite people, of moving forward, accepting defeat, being gracious, mm -hmm. talking about what we need to do is safeguard our elections, then it's like you just chip away at those things that people use to discredit him. But he gives people all of these ways like yeah. it, that. That is going to be played on a loop, on a loop, on a loop for people trying to take him down. That He's just weaving, as he said, to get away from at the entire 30, a three hour interview. They're going to take that 30 seconds and say, see, this is what we mean. But to somebody who just admitted that if the election was tomorrow, you are leading Trump. How do you rectify that, quote unquote, fear of him being dictator on day one? Do you think he has it like how are you? reconciling that emotion, that fear to say, you know what, that's, I still want to actually commit that vote toward in that direction. So to me, it comes down to what is going to be better for the country. And so I look at him and I think that he has the right instincts from an economic standpoint to move the country in a better direction than when I look at Kamala Harris. I also have, when, when I think about what are the big fears that drive me, there really are two, the economy, because ultimately it People feel good when the economy is growing, when their wages are growing. That makes such a difference. There may not be much else when it comes to the emotional well-being of the nation as a whole. Obviously, individually, it's a different story. But when you look at the nation as a whole, when people are making more money, when their kids are likely to do better than they did, like everything just feels good. And when the opposite is true, everything just feels bad. So that's a huge thing for me. Yeah. And then, ironically, because everybody thinks thinks that Trump is going to become a dictator if they dislike him, uh, tyranny is the other thing that for me is is absolutely terrifying. And when I've talked about this endlessly, and I will keep talking about it until everybody that can hear my voice has read these three books, but Mao the Unknown, Unknown Story, the Gulag Archipelago, and the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich paint a story of recent memory of how badly things go when people rule from the top down. And what I hear with Kamala Harris's language, it is all a bureaucratic blob. I don't even know that she has her own compass of what she believes. Like Trump is, as far as I can tell, is completely transparent. Mm -hmm. So if you think he's a lunatic, believe him because he's just saying what he thinks. Uh, whereas she has changed like wholesale cloth, I think following where she thinks the country is going. Yeah. I don't think she has this like hardcore thing that she believes that she's gonna push forward. And she's talking about things like price controls. Dude, every alarm bell I have goes off when people talk about price controls, when they talk about um, companies gouging, it's like that is not where your concern should be. All the free money stuff, it's just all of that really makes me deeply concerned. And then of course, the thing I've talked about many, many times before is the fact that she wants to tax unrealized gains. That That is just financial illiteracy. So you have financially illiterate, changes with the wind, and likes top down, whew, like it becomes not me moving towards Trump because I could make a very compelling case about all the things about him that make me nervous. Mm -hmm. It's more that I'm moving away from that, the, the tyranny of, a blob that has authoritarian tendencies. Yeah. That That is the thing that ultimately freaks me out. Copy. So if I could just kind of summarize that in one sentence, it's the rhetoric that Trump uses, while it might be divisive, you think is more kayfabe, whereas Kamala is endorsing policies that historically directly lead to tyranny. So I would rather take somebody who might say something offhanded, but then doesn't have the policy backing to make that happen versus on the other side, somebody who's backing policies that always lead to. Not quite, because I think okay. that I think Trump does have the policy instincts to reduce the amount of regulation, to reduce. The I'm talking tax specifically burden. about like the dictator on day one, like some of the rhetoric that we call divisive. I, I have not heard anything that 
people are quoting him as saying that when you listen to, you're like, yeah, he actually said that. Everything I've ever heard, I'm like, he was either talking about something else, bloodbath. He was clearly talking in the, he's talking about the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And the phrase bloodbath is a common phrase. It does not mean there are actually going to be people shot and dying in the streets. Yeah. That one was super clear to me. Uh, there's good people on both sides. Same thing. They're still mm -hmm. pumping that narrative. Um, so him saying that he's going to be a dictator for a day, he's joking, he's being hyperbolic. And that's why I think the one good thing to come out of that just being a true conversation versus a, an interview where Rogan is digging deep is that you can see just the personality of Trump. You can yeah. see, one, that he will talk out of both sides of his mouth. Crooked Hillary, uh, Comey did her dirty by saying, oh, this horrible thing, but she didn't really do it. This horrible thing, but mm -hmm. you know, we find there's nothing there. But he called her Crooked Hillary, and I could have put her away, and they had so much on her, all while saying Comey shouldn't have been tying her to those things. So he definitely talks out of both sides of his mouth. He definitely tries to make himself look good. He uh, talks very hyperbolic. Like he said, oh, I think I should be a whale psychologist. People are going to clip that out of context. He was obviously kidding. Mm -hmm. So it's like he, as somebody who I have been clipped out of context and I am easy to make look crazy, I know what they're doing with him. So that stuff I totally put to the side. Now, what I do take seriously is his frame of reference is that he's essentially always right. And once he believes something, it is very hard to pierce his frame of reference. And so what you are trusting is that he has the right instincts already. Mm -hmm. Now, seeing the team that he's putting around him, he's at least saying, okay, these people align with where I'm headed. So you've got the Make America Healthy Again, huge proponent of that. Uh, you've got the fears around the deep state. I'm a huge proponent of that. You've got Elon Musk talking about regulatory burden, free speech, huge proponents of that stuff. So judging by the people that he's surrounding himself by, I think that he has the better instincts of the two. And I've had four years with him already, so I know what I'm going to get. Um, but that's my read is there really are the bad things that you can point to on his side. Like you don't have to make them up and people keep making it up. Copy that. And that is you made up, you brought up a good point that through this interview, his personality shined through. And some of the things that the media has ran with are more personality traits. My example is when he says, when Joe Rogan asks him, how do you say in such good shape? And he's like, um, do you think it's golf? And Trump is like, no, it's genetics. And it's hilarious because he's overweight. He's a little bit big. Yeah, I was a little like, like, like he's not shape? a six foot four bodybuilder. But the mm -hmm. fact that he can say that with a straight face and keep talking is like, oh, OK, you're one of those guys. Let's run a thought experiment for a second. Let's say Trump gets in. We have four years of him. What's your approach? What's your first reaction? Walk us through. You just see Trump crack 270 on the Electoral College. Like, how do you feel? What do you think is happening next? Yeah, so I think this is a really important idea that people should do now is project into a future where Kamala Harris won. Project into a future where Donald Trump won. It's going to reveal what your actual gut level reaction is. For me, if Kamala Harris wins, I immediately go to, okay, the economy is my big concern. Uh, freedom of speech is my big concern. The attacks on the founding documents, those are my big concerns. But I, I don't want a preemptive strike. Like if they're, if they're not actually doing it, if they're not pursuing it, if they're not trying to chip away, or if gridlock is working and things are going well, I want, obviously want to make sure that my voice is heard and I have a platform and I'll speak. Um, but at the end of the day, it's those are going to be the things that I am concerned about. Those are going to be the areas that I'll put my attention into. I'm certainly mm -hmm. not going to be like the election was stolen and all of that whatever, if it's really, really close, let it play out in the normal way through the court system. If Trump wins, now I'm thinking, okay, uh, I want to make sure that he isn't going unhinged. I want to make sure that there are checks and balances. I want to make sure that I am correct, that he is going to govern like a moderate in the, the way he did in the first um, go round with him. Mm -hmm. And that January 6th was not some uh, tip of this crazy leaf that he's turned over and now he's just going to gobble up power and he uh, tried this coup that it didn't work but like I always teach people you learn from your failures and you know that he's putting his head down and figuring out okay what do I need to do and so then if you start seeing on either side that mm -hmm. this is really going in a dark direction then you respond accordingly but at that point it's going to be cooler heads need to prevail and look not to I don't want to be hyperbolic about this, but that's why we have the Second Amendment. You've got freedom of speech. If people are trying to take that away, then you've got recourse. But 
What I worry about is that when people run the thought of experiment of either Trump gets elected or Kamala gets elected, depending on what side of the fence you're on, that you want to do a preemptive strike, that that brings out this like attack yeah. dog in you that you want to charge forward. Um, that makes me nervous. And so I can feel everybody sort of couching language about, you know, if the election is free and fair, you certainly hear Trump saying it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want people leaning into that. That I think would be the only mistake. I was, that's a very good point. I was having a conversation with my roommate yesterday and we were talking about the election and the fear that's kind of surrounding politics. And to me, it feels like everybody's worried about a zombie apocalypse in some distant future, but nobody's paying attention to the giant 100 foot hole in the middle of our living room. And everybody's- What do you see as the giant hole? The lawfare that's happening in elections right now. The mm -hmm. fact that we're having free and fair politics, but RFK was getting sued in every state that he was on the ballot that he rightfully gained signatures for. They were trying to come and make an asterisk about his residency, making him invalid. Uh, the primary process being kind of sped through where the backdoor delegates was like, oh, well, she was on the take with Biden four years ago. She's good. We don't need to challenge her. Um, and on the very same vein on the Republican side where Nikki Haley was talking to four empty stools because nobody else showed up. But then she got 10 percent of the vote. Donald Trump got 90. And that was that was it. And to me, there there's this. One, the fact that this is a billion dollar presidential election is crazy to me and i'm not one of those people that that should have gone to the homeless kids or nothing like that but it's ridiculous that we are okay with this level of politics this level of money inside of politics full stop first and foremost second these auxiliary lawfare this is a great example like i don't know if you've been on this mormon wave that's happening and i promise mormon? you the the mormon wave like there's these mormon reality shows i what? promise i'm landing the plane Mormons. I heard about soaking. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> so Mormons, well, they don't drink and they don't smoke yep. because it's against the law and bad for the religion, and it makes up messes up your closeness with it's God. Not against the law, right? Just well, against it, their yeah, against like yeah, Mormon cultural, law, exactly. Yeah. But then on the flip side, there's like soda bars that they freaking all the time, and they drink like fifty ounces of soda every day. So it's like they train. They don't drink alcohol because it's an alcohol, it's addiction and they don't want to do that, but they drink soda every day and that's their addiction. So it's kind of like, it's the same action, but because this is, this looks this way, it's okay where this looks that way, it's bad. And I relate that to politics in the sense that we're already corroding. We already have so many things that need to be fixed. So mm. whether you're a Kamala person or a Trump person, and I'm voting third party because I need that 5% so that way they can actually be properly funded. Um, so that's my protest vote. But I, I really feel like we need to fix this cycle and it's not just Dominion voting booths and it's not just mail-in ballots, but we really need to look at like elections in general and say, okay, somebody giving a million dollars a day is kind of weird. Somebody raising a billion dollars in two weeks is kind of weird as well. Like we need to refocus our priorities on something more productive and and fruitful from the election process. I, I'm off my soapbox, but that just kind of got me activated just now. No, man, I love it. So <laughs> here is what I think is the reality mm -hmm. that all of these things move in cycles and there's no way to not be in the part of the cycle that you're in. And this is all tied to debt. And I know that people are gonna think that's overly simplistic, but I don't think it is. I think that the way all of wow. this goes is what ends up happening in the beginning, everything is fresh and new. Uh, there's only opportunity. And if you are the reserve currency of so much power and you get into that, I mean, this is everything goes back and back and back and back and back forever mm -hmm. and ever and ever. I believe we live in a deterministic universe. So take that with a grain of salt. But this is literally billiard balls bouncing around. So let's just clock it from the end of World War II. End of World War II, we become the reserve currency. Uh, we're the only major power that didn't get bombed into smithereens in the Western world. And so now we step into this incredibly formidable position where a lot of people owe us money and we're still in great shape. We're the strongest economy in the world all of a sudden. And now we get to grow mm -hmm. and we start growing. We have the baby boom. Everything is just going phenomenally well. And then for a whole host of reasons that are outside of the scope of today's podcast, um, the brakes end up falling off. We end up going off of the gold standard, which I think was a catastrophic error that I mean, you can debate with people about whether you need an inflationary economy or whether uh, deflation is good or bad. Anyway, set that aside. 
But looking at the way that these debt cycles go, you just start accumulating a ton of debt. And the only way to pay down the interest on that debt is to print money. Printing money is stealing. You're stealing money from people. And all of a sudden, they can't get ahead. And this is why you've got the WTF happened in 1971. This is when the whole process begins to break down. And now all of a sudden, you can't save your way into a retirement. You have to gamble your way into a retirement because you have to beat inflation. And so now all this money is pouring into the stock market. Some of that is for sure the creation of amazing companies. I do not want people to think that I think that the stock market is fake. The stock market is not fake. But when you look at it right now, you've got like seven companies, less than 10 companies that carry the vast majority of what's going on. And with AI, we're still in the speculative phase. So even though I'm big hyped on AI, you have to be honest that a lot of what's going on in the companies that are getting a lot of love, like NVIDIA around AI, maybe it pays off, maybe it doesn't, maybe they're you know over-indexing, maybe they're not, but we'll see, Like that still has to play out. But what's really happening is the value of the dollar is declining. And so when you have property like a house, mm -hmm. the house isn't actually going up in value unless you're suddenly finding yourself in like Austin where suddenly everybody's pouring into that state and there's legitimately more demand than there is supply. And then the property values are actually going up and they're outpacing inflation. But for the most part, even something like property is you're essentially taking out a um, insurance policy against inflation. You're saying, I'm gonna pay into this house to upkeep it, pay my property taxes, all that, to make sure that the value of the property keeps up with inflation. So when I'm old or when I die, that I've now got a savings account, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so as all of this is happening, it's deranging culture. And so Ray Dalio says that there are six stages of that debt cycle, and stage six is absolute collapse. He pegs us at being at phase 5.5, and so we are at the end stage where now everybody's fighting over what feels like a limited pie because that growth mm -hmm. isn't happening anymore. And so all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, our kids are gonna do worse than us financially. Our kids have less money in their 20s than we had. And dude, life expectancy is going down. And when you look at why it's deaths of despair for males, it's absolutely bananas. And so all this like crazy stuff becomes the the gunk and the gears of the machinery that is society. And so you can just feel us bogging down in the West. And so we're like, ah, fighting mm. at each other's throats. And the energy is going to transfer somewhere else. And the question becomes, where is the energy going to transfer to? Is it going to go to South America? Is it going to go to the Middle East? Now, I think the only 5.5 play is to assume that you can reverse it. I don't think you can give up. I don't think that makes any sense. And so you have to act as if you can be the first generation that reverses the trend. But when I really, I'm sitting there all alone at night, man, <laughs> I'm like, I have a feeling that you just ride the phase that you're given. Man, uh, I got dark. <laughs> I, got I dark. Mean, did it. So <laughs> here's the thing. And this is why, okay. So one, act as if, yeah. act as if these things can change. Act as if, we can pull each other back to the middle. Act as if you can get people to um, let go of all the negativity. Act as if the next generation, if you raise them right and you educate them and you create opportunity for them, that they will let go of some of the anger and bitterness that we see certainly in millennials, younger millennials especially. Mm -hmm. Like there's just resentment act as if we can let go of that and move towards something more beautiful. It does not make, the only thing you're gonna do is accelerate the negativity if you lean into it. So I think people have to act as if, but I am not a kayfabe fan. So I don't ever wanna fake what is actually going on inside my head. And I know that drives people crazy because I'll have these um, headlines and thumbnails that are like, you have to worry about this thing. <laughs> but like, when you actually get into the content, I'm like, all right, look, everything, we're gonna find a path even if I'm worried that we won't, there is a lesson that we can all learn from race car driving, which is if you want to avoid hitting the wall, look down into the turn where you want to go. Don't look at the wall. The second you look at the wall, you crash into the wall. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go wherever your focus is. So if we focus on all the things that are falling apart instead of, because you have to know they're there, instead of the solutions, you've got a problem. So I'm not saying don't address those. I think you're right. Hey, there's a gigantic hole in our living room. Okay, awesome. But now let's talk about what are the solutions that we're gonna do to address that. This is a big part of why I don't wanna see people do these preemptive strikes. It's like, what's the policy? Don't worry about ruining the other team. 
What are the policies that you want to see them adopt? Mm -hmm. How can you work with them? This is one of the things that I actually like about Trump. He'll walk into Kim Jong-un's lair. I don't know what they, what do they have. Uh, it's like, what, his castle, his palace is whatever. I think lair is the right word. Uh, and he'll joke around with him, you know, like you've got a red button, but I've got one and mine's even bigger than yours. Um, you have to deal with that thing and actually come up with a solution. And so him joking and building a relationship, these are the steps that you can make to say, okay, how do we find a path forward instead of just saying, uh, it's called Thucydides trap where you've got these two great powers that are just rushing headlong towards each other because one is rising and one is declining and they just end up smashing into each other. So Trump, I think, has a personality that could actually avoid that because he's done business for so long in New York, bro. You yeah. gotta deal with the mafia. Yeah. And so it's, I'm not saying the mafia is like today. I'm just saying coming up in the 80s, I cannot imagine that doing real estate in the and 80s. And he was in, in Atlantic York, City. He definitely dealt with the mafia. Yeah, facts. <laughs> so um, that's where I think if you have a solution-oriented mindset, you deal with the world the way that it is, not the way that you wish it would be, that you can actually find solutions. But if you're not willing to put everything out on the table and look at where are we actually, then you're never going to find a path forward. So I want to know we're in phase 5.5, but then I don't want to stare at the wall. I want to look at the solutions and actually chart a course forward. I love that. All right. You made me feel better. Thank you. Yeah. I might be well, able to Well, now we actually have to find the, <laughs> the course and we have to stop people from fighting because what I worry about is that both sides are in a preemptive strike mentality yeah. and both are going to cry foul. Both are going to freak out no matter what happens. Uh, and that I worry about that. hundred percent. And the media already kind of picking sides. I don't think helps either because everybody's going to go to their respective bubbles to watch the results. And depending on what you're watching, it's going to be a great day or a bad day. And yeah, like you said, after that, it could derange really fast. Yeah. And I think so. Um, let me know how naive this is. In fact, I don't need to be naive. What do I know about people? Okay, so when half of us, our team isn't going to lose. Sorry, half of us, our team isn't going to win. And in that moment, now it's got to be, okay, cool. So we have the other side is in power. How do we work together to be persuasive? How do we make sure that we get our agenda done? Even that makes me feel expansive versus thinking like, oh my God, they're going to run it into the ground. Uh, Kamala Harris is going to be, it's going to be, she's the face of the blob that's going to mm -hmm. take me into tyranny. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't want to allow my mind to go in that direction. So if people can want good things for each other, you've got a chance. But if people hunker down and are just bitter about losing, we're in trouble. We shall see. Nine days away. All right. Lightning round. I got a couple things Let's for you. It. You ready? Ready. What's your funniest moment of the interview? Uh, when Trump was talking about Kim Jong-un and comparing the size of their nuclear arsenal. I know that's dark. <laughs> that is like straight out of uh, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, Dr. <laughs> Strangelove. But it, it was darkly hilarious. This was a two-parter, okay? November 6th happens. November 5th, the election happens. A week later, do you see violence happening? I am legitimately concerned, yes. I've always had sort of a 2020 vision of pockets of protesting that's mostly peaceful. Happy. On the flip side of that, are you in generally, are you in general politically optimistic? I do feel like this is a new awakening. There's a lot of eyes on politics right now. Do you see a political hope in the future? If I want to continue to earn my own respect, I will constantly find an optimistic option to move forward. And that doesn't mean being Pollyanna-ish. You need to look at the way things really are. Um, but I don't want to be, even if I'm really worried we're headed in the right direction, you've got to find something to move towards, not just something to move away from. That'll be very important to me. Nice. Who do you think wins? If the election is today, it seems like Trump has more energy. So my gut instinct is that it's going to be ridiculously close, which is the one thing I don't want, uh, but that Trump wins. Who is the next superpower? Oh, very clearly China. That's the only people that are in contention with us. There is nobody else, not even close. Russia is a, a regional power, but on the world stage, 
There's only the U.S. and China. Nobody else has a big enough economy. I thought there was more like bubbling, but I guess that's a no, really good point. Not, not yeah. even close. Does China overtake the U.S. in the next five years? That's interesting. They've really fallen off the radar because we're so focused on the election. Mm -hmm. I'll be very keen to get people talking about that again because um, I don't know what to believe about the state of their economy. If their economy is as bad as some people are saying, yeah. that could delay them a very long time, and it'll be interesting to see how they get out of that. Um, but I would never underestimate China. Those guys are not for play. Uh, so I think that China has, they're, they're a pure competitor. And so if we are not very, very strategic in what we do with our economy, yes, they will overtake us. At, at, on certain levels, I think they already have overtaken us. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, they're not, they're not to be taken lightly. Copy that. All right, that's all I got. There we go. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have not already, be sure to subscribe and help me find an optimistic path forward. Until next time, my <laughs> friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. If you like this conversation, check out this episode to learn more. We were like, it's coming to Hollywood. You're in Los Angeles, right? Yup. Is there anyone in Hollywood that doesn't realize that they're coming? Yes, there still is. And here, will there be anyone? No. Emod is a guy who's right at that edge, building AI models that are truly shaping the future.